I'm going to go ahead with the meeting beginning ritual. 起立，面向佛堂，参加三鞠躬、一鞠躬、再鞠躬、三鞠躬，参加多一点喘息、一鞠躬、开班、一鞠躬，请坐下。Please be seated. And、uh, good morning, or afternoon, or evening, wherever you happen to be today. And thank you for being with us for this installment of our online Tao study group.、Uh, I'm able to to see the attendees, and it's always a joy to see you guys here. You know, a lot of the same folks week after week, and it's a, it's a wonderful thing. It may sound like something of a platitude when I say that、uh, every week, but really and truly. You know, this is a huge part of my life. It's a huge part of Derek's life. It's it's something that we're we're committed to that we、uh, that we do week in and week out with with precious few exceptions, and it is a blessing. I, I, I'm sure I'm not speaking out of turn here when I say that for both of us, it's a, a joy and a blessing to be able to present this and, and to see you all here as we as we mutually. Try to understand and, and apply the Tao teachings in our lives. So welcome. That being said, I'm fixing to become emotional today. This is this is Bill Sunday rant, my very first one ever. So, in, in as much as I ever yell, <laughs> here we go. There there are a number of things that, that just really tick me off, and, and I want I want to talk about it today. I, I truly do. Uh, I, I actually have have a remarkably well developed middle finger、uh, for item number one on this list: poor driving.、Um, I drive two hours a day simply for the privilege of getting to and coming home from work, and I drive down one of the busiest、uh, arteries in Indianapolis,、uh, Meridian Street or US 31,、uh, between Westfield and downtown Indianapolis. On a good day in light traffic, it is. Almost exactly an hour from my door to the the, the door of the Simon Building.、Uh, on a bad day, that trip can be anywhere from an hour and forty five minutes to heaven only knows how long.、Uh, and in in the winter, when the roads get snowy and icy, that becomes even even worse. And, and no matter what the conditions are, I see people weaving in and out of traffic, cutting people off, tailgating, going either way too fast or way way too slow. And, and I got to tell you that that just that just makes me so unbelievably irritated. I can hardly stand myself. I particularly hate it when somebody gets three inches away from my rear bumper, because I know if I have to if I have to stop suddenly, I'm going to be wearing whatever it is is behind me. I have said in a somewhat less than joking manner to my family that I seriously need to have machine guns installed on my van. And、it's probably a good thing I can't do that legally. That that really really gets under my skin.、And、the other thing that really really gets me going is, is willful ignorance, where where you you know that people are aware of what they should do, but they don't do it anyway, and they don't do it on purpose, whatever it is, or or they do things by intention uh, uh, that they know doggone good and well they shouldn't, right? Uh, cutting in line at the lunch counter, or、uh, shoving people out of the way, or、uh, running down a crowded、uh, a crowded aisle or hallway, or pushing their way up or down an escalator because whatever it is they have to do is so much more important than any of the rest of us. They cannot possibly wait for that device to operate on its own.、And、that goes along with the third one: bad manners, right? Just the、uh, The simple breaches of day-to-day -day common courtesy that would make life so much easier if all of those other people would simply adhere to the rules of common courtesy and get the heck out of my way. And there's loud and boisterous behavior, which, when I call somebody out for their poor behavior, is usually the result. Right? When I tell somebody how dumb they are for cutting in line or for pushing and shoving or whatever. Their response is never to realize their 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 fault and get out of the way and act like a respectable human being. They want to argue about it. I can't stand that. So naturally, I have to put them in their place. I'm bigger and stronger than they are, and I don't want to listen to it anyway. And I really hate haters. 
what they hate is irrelevant. The fact that they hate is relevant. It's like their point of view is the only thing that we should have to listen to, and the fact that they don't like somebody else means I shouldn't like them either. Well, maybe I do or don't like the, the object of their hatred, but I guarantee you I don't like them. <laughs> Same thing goes for zealots, right? The door knockers and Bible thumpers that show up at the front door trying to convince me their way is the only way to enlightenment. Give me a break. I lump most of these folks into the category of mean people, people who for some reason believe that their way of thinking is something that they have to cram down my throat because if I don't have their their innate knowledge and wisdom, I'm either going to go to hell or suffer for it. The thought that I may be happy and content living my life the way I'm living it just never occurs to them. In short, I get mad at people that don't think like me. Does anybody think what I just said was funny? It isn't, is it? Here's the deal. While I'm carrying on like a crazy person about all the people who really get me ticked off, okay, I have to say in the same sentence that I have been those people. To this day, from time to time, I have been those people. I've been the guy tailgating the guy in front of me because he's going too slow for me to stand. It's hard to believe I've behaved that way, isn't it? I mean, after all, I have the milk of human kindness flowing through every vein. Yeah, right. The truth of the matter is we all have been those people. We all have. From time to time, despite our very best efforts, we all have been those people, and, and we will continue to be every now and again. Why do you suppose that is? I, I actually have an idea about that. You, you probably thought that was that was coming. <laughs> it, it's because we're emotionally attached to what we're doing and where we are and what the situation is. And, and as individuals, we all tend to think that what, what we're doing is, is isolated, that it's occurring in our little piece of reality and it doesn't affect anybody else. But the, the truth of the matter is that everything we do affects the people around us, particularly in close quarters. If we're the one pushing and shoving in line because we're in a hurry, we're not just trying to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. We're inconveniencing the 20 or 30 people in front of and behind us. But in the moment, because our emotions are, are stimulated and we're uh, in a hurry and we're trying to get something done, it's not possible for our brains to consider what we're what we're doing to the folks around us. And that's why from time to time we still become those people. I'm the guy on a snowy or icy day who's doing 25 miles an hour down the right-hand lane of the interstate. I've gotten to the point in my life where I just refuse to drive on ice. I just won't do it. I have the ability to work from home, and, and, you know, I've seen enough really horrible accidents going to and from work that I just, just flat out won't do it. I, I am not a good driver on, on really, really bad conditions, um, and it isn't worth the risk. So, you know, I, I made that adjustment there. If it's if it's snowy or rainy or what have you, I'll, I'll go out and drive, and I'm, I'm pretty good at that, but on ice, I just plain won't do it anymore. So what the heck do we do? Knowing that we all, while we concurrently have the milk of human kindness and all of the rattlesnake venom in the world circulating through us, what do we what do we do? I have some thoughts about that. We could just acknowledge that this is human nature and give up and accept the obvious truth that both we and all the people around us are. Uh, destined to be buttheads most of the time and just just take what's coming or dish it out and go on with life irregardless of the feelings we hurt the toes we step on and the number of times we get kicked in the shins we 
could do our very best to help everybody else realize their obvious flaws and faults and mistakes, and then do our very best to help them correct them with the absolute assurance that, that they're going to realize that they're, that they're uh, you know, horribly flawed and are going to be desirous of our assistance in helping them improve their lives. I've got to tell you, I've, I've never found that to be really very effective. <laughs> Or we could redouble our efforts to not behave in, in the ways that irritate us, to not be the people that, that really get under our skin, and not to respond with anger and outrage and, and, and uh, righteous indignation when we're confronted by the kinds of bad behavior that we ourselves are guilty of doing. However, that third option is by, by, by a huge margin far and away the most difficult of, of those choices. And so, you know, I find myself asking the question, why would I even want to try to do that? Why would I want to put myself through that kind of life-changing trauma? Why do I want to uh, you know, sign up for the kind of work and effort that's going to be required to transform my life instead of trying to transform the lives of those around us? After all, it is so much easier to point out the flaws and shortcomings in others than it is to stare in the mirror and point them out to myself. And it's a whole bunch easier to tell somebody else they need to change rather than to try to change myself. Sometimes I have days where I have so many flaws and shortcomings, I can't remember them all. I've got to put a reminder in my phone that says, don't be a butthead today. And that doesn't even begin to cover it. But I can remember every flaw and shortcoming of the guy that cut me off in traffic yesterday. I want a picture of his license plate so I can go chase him down and explain it to him. You know, well, you know, <laughs> ah, there we go. I can't even operate my slides correctly right now. There is an essential duality in our existences that we must acknowledge and we have to accept because when we do that, we're able to see things a little more clearly. There is always the way of the world and there is always the way of the doubt. And very often, those two particular methodologies are not aligned. The way of the world, almost by definition, does not accept a way of peace and harmony and uh, stress-free and smooth social interaction or interpersonal relationships. It isn't that there's not the appearance of courtesy and civility in the way of the world. There is. And in fact, those things can be created uh, out of thin air when it's necessary, but they're not enduring. They don't create a change in mindset or thought or will or in the, the spirit of the individual. They simply create a change in, in temporary behavior based on a situation. It is the appearance of etiquette as opposed to the, the adherence to virtue. It is not perhaps the, the best path one could ultimately aspire to. The lesson, I believe, that we are meant to learn as we go through these situations is to align those approaches in each individual life so that as we move through the way of the world, we do that according to the path of the Tao. And as we do that, as we practice those, those techniques, as we begin to use the teachings to help us navigate those situations, we become our higher selves. And when that happens, the example that we set for others gets better because we make better choices and we behave more appropriately. And what I've found is when we do that, the most miraculous thing happens. The people around us begin to behave in the way that we wanted them to behave to begin with not because we beat them about the head and shoulders with their flaws and shortcomings, 
But because we set an example that was worthy of emulating, and they rose to their highest and best good because they didn't want to embarrass themselves. It is almost like following the path of the Tao evokes in others that, that true self that desires to behave in a better way, in that refined sense of spirit and self that's more courteous, more benevolent, more forgiving, and less attached to shoving their way to the front of whatever line it is you happen to be standing in. But I'm going to tell you, doing this is not a work of, of apathy or inaction. It is intense work and effort because it is overcoming ourselves. I want you to consider that for a second. Because the work of facing yourself in the mirror and overcoming those things that are uh, uh, flawed thinking is difficult. Being that kind of self-honest is tough because it, it means we have to admit to ourselves that we are not necessarily the people we thought we were. Heaven forbid that we might be wrong or discourteous or downright mean every now and again. But if we are, we got to admit it because until we admit it, we can't change it. Chapter 48 of the Tao Te Ching says, Pursue knowledge, daily gain. Pursue Tao, daily loss. Loss and more loss until one achieves unattached action. With unattached action, there is nothing one cannot do. Take the world by constantly applying non-interference. The one who interferes is not qualified to take the world. This particular chapter of the Tao Te Ching is so remarkably powerful in its implications for, for human social interaction that I couldn't let it go by this morning. <laughs> I, I, I apologize for my ranting and raving, and like I said, when I started, that was purely tongue-in-cheek. Although, you know, the, the feelings and emotions I am, I am intimately familiar with, because I've been there over and over and over and over again. The, the trick to applying these teachings is the desire to find a better way to do things and, and then applying that to our lives. So it isn't that I haven't had the emotions or, or done the bad behaviors that I'm talking about. I've done every one of them, and a lot of them multiple times. And to this very day, I still struggle. Uh, every now and again with the discourteous, the mean, and the unsafe. You know, my, my rationale behind giving somebody hell about their driving is that I don't really want to get killed. But, you know, if, if today is my day to go, and I'm supposed to go because I got mangled in a horrible car accident, I'm not sure giving somebody a hard time for their inability to drive is going to save me from that. The power in this chapter is understanding that we're not talking about the esoteric or, or ethereal search for knowledge or Tao. This is a real honest-to-goodness, rubber-meets-the-road uh, kind of a, a roadmap or blueprint for how these interactions can work better. The, the discussion on loss and more loss is, is, is not necessarily a teaching about getting rid of stuff, although there certainly is that is that uh, uh, the teaching in this in this philosophy. This is about ridding ourselves of the emotions, the attachments, and the desires that lead us to an emotional perspective where we want to beat somebody about the head and shoulders for something they've done. It's caused our righteous indignation and sense of personal slight to be stimulated so that we feel a compelling need to go educate them about what a dumbass they are. If we manage to lose enough, 
finally we get to the point where we are not attached to an outcome or a desire or a method. And with the unattachment comes the release of caring about what the other person does and how they do it. We're no longer desirous and focused on a particular outcome, a particular way that something unfolds. We become almost a spectator in the situation, responding to what we need to respond to, but in a, a much more positive and detached fashion. Think about, for instance, uh, the choice you make when you're at dinner, right? Family goes out to dinner, sits down in the restaurant. You started out maybe wanting some kind of pasta. You get to the restaurant, they didn't have exactly what you wanted, so you pick something else. The process of picking something else doesn't cause a huge emotional reaction and a, and a tremendous outburst and, and given the given the server hell for breakfast because they didn't have what you wanted, it simply becomes a different selection. There was no significant attachment to the pasta and therefore no need to have a huge emotional thing. That's the process. It's pretty easy to do when you're substituting dinner items. It can be a whole bunch more difficult when somebody cuts you off and almost gets you into a car accident. But the process is exactly the same. And it's the process we gotta learn. That's why Lao Tzu says with unattached action, there is nothing one cannot do. By using unattached action, we no longer have the emotional investment in the outcome. And therefore, we can examine the available options in a much more clear and realistic light. That's also why he says that one who interferes is not qualified to take the world. That interference comes from the attachments, from the emotional desires, from the, the will for a particular outcome and the need to force that outcome into reality. That kind of interference doesn't usually result in a positive outcome. It normally results in a lot of hurt feelings. You know, <laughs> as previously demonstrated, there are a plethora of things that get under our skin and make us emotional or upset or downright angry at somebody else. Those things happen every single day. In fact, the fact that we live the way we do near other people, you know, where we, we work in, in offices and surroundings where there are a lot of other people and we live in neighborhoods or apartment buildings in close proximity to other people absolutely guarantees that, that sooner or later there's going to be the occasional conflict or disagreement. It's going to happen. The only way for that to not happen is for us to all live in little isolated capsules somewhere, and that just just isn't gonna isn't gonna occur. So we we know up front that the the stage has been set, and and all of the players are present for a conflict or a disagreement. How we choose to respond, or how we initiate those interactions with all those other people in large part determines what the outcome of that interaction is going to be and what the feelings of the participants are going to be when it's over. That's where the rubber meets the road for unattached action. That's where we, we find out whether we have the emotional investment in the outcome or not. Therefore, if we have achieved the unattached action, we can drop the agendas and let go of the goals and get rid of the, the emotional affectations and, and desires that add friction to those conflicts and disagreements and diffuse them before they ever start. This isn't just a lesson on, on conflict management and fight avoidance. That's a life lesson. Right, We all get involved in projects or in, 
and things that we have to do for a living or with our families or in some other context where where the activity we're trying to perform becomes stressful, becomes difficult, uh, where we have perhaps several different ways to get something accomplished and we're not real sure which one's going to be the best or the most effective. And if we are emotionally invested in one particular method and we pursue that no matter how it how it seems to be working, you know, we can we can bring to ourselves uh, so much stress and conflict internally that we don't even need another person to have a blow up. We can have our, our very own little mini meltdown trying to build a Pinewood Derby, Pinewood Derby race car or a plastic model or cook breakfast or virtually anything we're, we're trying to do because we didn't give ourselves the latitude to consider a different option. So once again, got to repeat it. With unattached action, there is absolutely nothing that cannot be done. There is nothing one cannot do. I surely hope you guys found this somewhat humorous as well as hopefully somewhat informative. <laughs> it is always a joy to share with you, and I truly hope something I said was, was useful. Thank you all very much. No, thank you. Uh, I definitely appreciate hearing about your uh, road rage incident. Um, and that that kind of reminds me, did I ever tell you about my, my own road rage experience? No, actually not. But please do. Well, this happened uh, many years ago. Uh, I'm sure it's an experience many people uh, share. I, I'm driving on the road and I suddenly found myself caught behind a very slow driver. So the driver in front of me was so slow that it made it very difficult for me to change lanes because everybody else was going so much faster. So you probably, you know, I think many people are like, yeah, okay, in there. So as I'm trapped behind the slow driver, I'm getting pretty hot under the collar, you know, I'm, steam is coming out of my ears. I'm getting, you know, more and more angry by the, by the minute. You know, ah, oh, can't stand this guy in front of me. Uh, of course, I had no way to know that it was actually a man in front of me. I just thought of the driver that way. You know, can't stand this guy. Oh, man, uh, why can't you just, you know, stay at home? You don't know how to drive, you know, stuff like that. So all this stuff is going through my my mind is I'm watching, keeping my eyes on the, uh, the traffic behind me as all these cars are whizzing by at much higher speeds, looking for an opening. So finally, an opening appeared to, to show uh, behind me because there's like a big gap between the very fast cars. So I timed it, you know. So at the moment when one car goes by, I immediately got into that lane you know, uh, accelerated as soon as I could to get past a slow car in front of me. And as I'm passing that slow car, I think it's customary in America to ritualistically extend the middle finger or to yell. Uh, but, you know, already cultivating spirituality, I felt that I couldn't do that. You know, that would be, uh, oh, I should be above that. I'm supposed to be teaching people how to remain calm, right? So I, I don't feel good about uh, uh, flipping the bird or something like that. So, but I still could not resist, you know, turning around to look at this other driver to give him like a really hateful stare of death. You know, how dare you drive so slow? You know, that type of thing. So I'm turning and I'm looking and I recognize who that driver is. I suddenly realized that the driver was someone that I knew Indeed, someone that I knew from high school was a teacher in my high school, and now I have to sort of like uh, clarify, I went to uh, a Catholic high school. The person who was driving was, I recognized him as Father Montez, who was like 60 years old. Now, I liked Father Montez. He was, he was uh, a mentor for a lot of us kids. He was kind. He was funny, he was always interesting in his lectures, 
of course, he's getting uh, kind of kind of up in age, so he couldn't drive very fast, and he, he didn't see me. I saw him, but he was, like, focusing on the road, you know, trying to concentrate on driving because it was probably not that easy for him, right? But then in that moment of recognition, all the anger that I had, all the hatred that I experienced just vanished into thin air because I realized who that is. Oh, Father Montes, you know, and uh, I, I wasn't thinking the same thoughts anymore. I wasn't cursing him out anymore because I knew him. I knew that he uh, was doing the best he could, you know. So I just kept on driving. I drove off, you know, without without honking and hey, Father Montes. I didn't do that. I just I just drove off. But later on, though that episode stayed with me because I kept thinking in my mind, I remember how mad I was, how angry I was with trap behind five months when I didn't know that's who, that's who he was. And then when I realized that was him, that it was him, all that anger just kind of went away. And it was just a huge difference. I couldn't get over how, how big of a difference it was. Then I thought about the other times when I was trapped behind other drivers and I, you know, even after checking out who they were and I had no idea, I didn't know them, they were strangers to me. So then other times the anger, the hatred did not go away, but this time it did. What was the difference? The difference was me knowing the driver, me having friendly feelings, positive feelings toward this person that I knew. So it's all based on feeling. It's all based on whether I know this person or not. Hmm, well, that's kind of strange. Then I thought about all these other people that I still haven't met. But if I hadn't met them socially, I probably would like them. I would probably get to know them, understand their life situation. And if some, I pass someone who's a slow driver, I may, you know, look at, oh, oh, okay, I know who that is. Maybe not Father Montes, maybe someone else but then I wouldn't be quite as mad. So knowing somehow determines the amount of anger, but who out there was someone that I could not become friends with? I'm sure that if I got to know people, I would probably like them, you know, the vast majority of them. So would that mean that I really shouldn't get mad at anybody? Huh? How does that work? So... <laughs> interesting so now nowadays when i get trapped behind another slow driver i try to imagine that this is a person that i knew with a very rich life story because let's face it everybody is a uh, is a story is a uh, is a whole novel in their own right everybody has their own challenges uh their their ups and downs their aspirations and so forth you know, who knows why they were driving slow that particular time. Maybe driving is tough for them. They may not be nearly, they may not be 60 years old like Father Montes, but maybe they have other challenges. Maybe the car that they were driving was, is a clunker, and so they have to be very careful. Maybe they were totally stressed out. There's a lot on their minds, so they can't, they can't focus on the road as much as uh, I would prefer them to. But whatever the case may be, there's some kind of reason behind someone driving slowly and me being trapped behind them. So who am I to say that if I didn't know more, that I would still be, that I would still carry just as much anger and hatred. So then it seems to me that all of that negative, negative feelings I was carrying, all that negativity that, that I had inside my heart, um, they really weren't that meaningful. They were things that I could dismiss with, uh, with simply by, by understanding with clarity that in that other car is a human being that potentially I could get to know. Someone that if life had played out differently, I would actually know as a friend. So, huh, there's no reason for me to get mad at anybody. So there you go. That was the end of road rage that I experienced. So from that point on, I did not feel the need to get hot under the collar, to have steam come out of my ears, to get 
to, to feel all that, you know, anxiety and, and negativity toward another person. So, so Bill, that's my uh, real rage, real life story for you. That's excellent. <laughs> we, we all learn it in our own way, but hopefully we all learn it. Let's go ahead and do the meeting ending ritual, everybody. Chili. Mian Xiang Huo Tang. Sija Sanjigong, Yi Jigong. Sai Jigong. San Jigong. Sija Go Din Chuan Xi Jigong. Xie Ban Yi Jigong. We're done, everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs>